everyone. I'm really happy to welcome you all here, and it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce our two speakers today. Um, Dajin Kang, an Enlight Fellow, is a PhD student in School of Communication Studies. Dajin is a researcher, teacher, scholar, and practice center public intellectual with an ultimate goal of promoting meaningful <coughs> social change. Her research and teaching interests center on the intersections of organizational communication, relationships across cultures, and community building at local, national, and international. Shrika Hawthorne is a first year graduate student in the International Development Studies Program. A resident of Jamaica, she has an interested interest in community development and social change and uses every opportunity presented to her to give voice to the voiceless. Ultimately, she hopes to use the knowledge gained from her studies to complement her innate drive to help others to bring about positive change, positive social change in communities she plans to work. So, making use of space at Alden. To, um, as a means of engaging students, Kang and Hawthorne installed posters on the second and fourth floors, which asked students to finish the very brave sentence, I want to change, dot, dot, dot. Today's presentation will highlight the research process on critical pedagogy. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you for introducing us, so we don't have to do it again. So, <laughs> well, uh, you can see our names over there. So I'm Dong Jing. Uh, I'm from Communication Studies. I'm a 30-year PhD uh, student. Well, uh, so here's my co-star Shurika. <laughs> Hi. Um, I almost didn't recognize who she was talking about just now through the introduction, but thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, and as she mentioned, I am a first-year graduate student in the International Development Studies Program, and we are here today just to give you some information about our project that we uh, did last semester in the library. Practicing critical pedagogy using I want to change. Yeah, so you, as you can see on the, the side, um, the bright yellow poster, that's one of the sample we have on the second floor entrance. So that's where we get most of the response. Might be, you know, any of you here, you might write on the board. I just don't know, right? So here is the sample of I want to change. So we'll go through in detail about how this project starts and then. Uh, introduce your processes, right? So, here's the page. So, usually they tell us that when you're doing a presentation, you should give a roadmap so that persons can know when they should leave. So, <laughs> this is our roadmap, so to speak, just an overview of what we'll be talking about today. So, we'll be just giving a basic idea of what critical pedagogy means because. A lot of my friends back home have been saying, what is that, what is that? So you know, we'll be telling you a little bit about what that is. Then we'll be telling you about our brainstorming process, the preparation, the procedures that we, we participated in to get to where we are, leading to the process right now. And also, we will look at the data analysis <laughs> and look at the themes that were generated from the posters. And finally, we'll be looking at some reflections and implications of our research. Or one of the things that we realized through our study is that there are assumptions about the way we live, there are assumptions about how we are educated, and these assumptions are often taken for granted. So part of what we leaned towards was what McLaren says in terms of explaining what critical pedagogy referred to, and that is that it critically appropriates knowledge that exists outside of or immediate surroundings and it, it calls for students to broaden their understanding of themselves and the world that we live in and thus transform those taken for granted assumptions about the way we live. And then our aim, our main aim was to find a statement that was closely connected to social change within a public space that was educational. And therefore, we decided on the statement, I want to change. This, we hoped, would have planted a seed of change within the students of the Ohio University. And so when we were brainstorming, DJ and I met in the library by sheer coincidence, divine intervention, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I said, hi, Sharika. She said, hi, Sharika. What, what are, are you, you doing for your final project? I said, I don't know. I said to her, what are you doing? She said, I don't know. <laughs> and so we sat down and we brainstormed a bit here in the library on the second floor. Yeah. And we discussed some of the things that we wanted to get out of the project. And we, we wanted to find out 
where social change begins within a university community. We wanted to find out what are some of the things that prevents us from making this social change. We also wanted to find out how this social change occurs within a social set, an educational setting rather. And finally, we wanted to find out what, the, what, what, what was a meaningful social change that we could get um, on a personal and also a social level. Um, so while we were sitting at the second floor of the library and near the computer, really troubled about our final project, because we only have um, three weeks, yes. right? Three or four weeks to uh, to finish, and uh, we must finish creatively. And um, so um, we uh, we were actually inspired by an artist. Uh, so here is Candy Chan. So Candy Chan has done a project called Before I Die. So as you can see from uh, from from this picture, so Candy Chan uh, after her loved ones passed away um, a few years ago, so she started to uh, think about what is the meaning for my life and what's the meaning for the other's life, right? So she started to uh, do graffiti walls uh, and put it on the abandoned walls or in the community or in public places like coffee houses, outside the coffee house or sometimes in the coffee house and then put a poster everywhere. So um, this I want, before I die, well, I want to do something. So there are so many places um, and it's very successful. It spreads out over 60 countries and with 25 languages. So this is the, uh, what we're inspired by Candy Chan's work. Um, so we're thought about public places, like outside of um, university, right? Um, however, um, well, last semester, this, as you know, that this is the coldest winter um, in the past 20 years, 10 years. So, uh, making something like this outside would be very difficult to um, uh, ask the students to think about their voice. So this project mainly start with we want students and commu university community members just to pause and think about what they really want to change or create change. What are the meaningful moments in their life? So we think about we must move this project indoors pragmatically. Um, so here is our inspiration. Uh, and then after we're talking um, for an hour, another hour, <laughs> after we've seen Candy Chan's work, uh, we thought about the library because we're sitting on uh, on the computer of this computer area of the second floor. So we looked at the glass, you know, glass entrances of the second floor. We thought about the library. We're thinking about the library as a cultural institution uh, to make this project work. So according to um, cultural uh, anthropologist, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Ferguson, 1992. So he uh, he proposed an idea of space and identity. So we picked the library because of the theory of space and identity. Because library as an educational space, that means uh, creating a students or educational identity and we keep recreating that identity. That's why here is the space. So um, since um, we did some more research on our library. Um, here is the mission of the library. I found that so super connected to our project. So the vision is the library will be a dynamic gateway for discovery, creation, and exchange of knowledge, and enabling students, faculty, and staff to realize their promises and achieve excellence. So this is how our project starts, starts from the vision. And also, we we search the value of the library. One of the value of the library centers on critical thinking. So this is also another connection um, to our critical pedagogical practice um, at such a space. And then we want to explore how students' identity are created and co recreated in this educational space. So eventually we made the decision, let's do it here. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, why we focus on education and social change? Initially, um, according to um, edu educational scholar Paulo Freire, um, he really believed that change starts when individuals find a voice in themselves. So that plan, that, that the seed of change will stay in um, our students. So that's the uh, first of all what we're thinking about, connecting with the critical theory in education. So. Um, 
in this project, we really hope our students and the university community members, including faculty and staff, really think about themselves and act on themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So we made, we eventually decided that statement. I want to change that. that, that. So hopefully, you know, some meaningful statement of dialogue will emerge in this alternative space where uh, we're co-creating in the library space. So. Here's the general idea of education for social change, and uh, we went through a lot of preparations because um, as a researcher, I was traditionally an ethnographer. I always go to the field and interview people and uh, transcribe the interviews. So this is really the first thing we did that's really non-traditional, non-traditional research. This wasn't defined as a human subject research. It's because IRB defined human subject as researcher directly connect and contact with uh, with participants. However, uh, we both are, this project wasn't defined as uh, needed IRB review because we're not directly uh, involved with our participants. So, the preparations. So, for our preparation, we did a lot of serious thinking about what we wanted to use, the material that we wanted to use, the things that we wanted to get people to like just grab their attention right away. So, we went shopping. <laughs> And <laughs> we went to a few stores and we found some cartridge paper that we thought were pretty inexpensive. And um, as you can see, we took pictures of the different colors because we also wanted to use colors that would brighten people's day or just bring it to their attention once they walked into the particular room that they were walking into. And I should mention that, as DJ uh, stated earlier, this occurred like three or four weeks before finals, and um, DJ in that very week had to leave the for Tuesday conference. for yeah. a conference, an entire for an entire week's conference. So all of this happened in one night. Yeah. So we met at her house and we tried many different things to come to this. <laughs> we tried using stencils. We tried using markers, we tried carving on hard, hard paper boards, we tried making the stencils ourselves, and they all failed. All failures. So we finally decided that if we wanted to use the bright color cartridge papers to, you know, highlight the process, we needed to use also um, large print, larger writing print that people will be able to see. And we finally settled, courtesy of DJ and her skills, on using Chinese brush paints, and this was the final product. Um, if you move to the other side, DJ, you will see that this was our final project. Also, again, even though we have, um, we wanted to use even like the green um, poster to kind of you know bring students to that place where they would recognize the school colors. <laughs> serious process, I'm telling you, very serious. <laughs> And this was our final product. So uh, we start our procedures of applying for the space because we prepared all the poster boards, mm -hmm. right? And then we want to know where should, should we go. Yes. So I went to uh, the uh, front desk of library to ask, I want to do such a project. Who am I going to talk with? So they suggest uh, uh, Miss Kelly Bolton, uh, who is the, uh, the assistant dean for research and education service. And she's very supportive. She approved this project immediately. On the spot. Yeah, on the <laughs> spot. So thank you so much. And uh, uh, that's how we start our project. Um, a lot of procedures. We, uh, we wrote a survey proposal yes. about uh, the general procedure, what we're going to do, and what our expect expectation is. Right. Um, so with um, the proposed date was November the 25th um, to December the 3rd last year. So, um, and initially we proposed the four spaces right, yes. on our proposal. Uh, with Ms. Wharton's help, we narrowed down into uh, two sections right. um, because they're uh, uh, second floor open space and fourth floor open space that's with most traffic. Right, you know, we wanted to put them on, if you were familiar with the second floor li of the library, you would notice that there's some glass windows. We wanted to put them on the outside of that so that persons who were coming in would you know, stop and write on the boards, but Ms. Broughton, Broughton you know, brought it to our attention that people are busy moving to and fro, nobody really has time to stop within that space to write or to read 
whatever is on a poster. But if you put it directly, first of all, on the fourth floor, as you enter that room, then you, people will be bound to stop because it's right there in their faces. So that was how we narrowed it down to the second floor. And then the fourth floor was kind of the same thing. It was in the open space within the computer area. And um, it was also where there was a lot of traffic going to and fro. So our uh, next one is our color as persuasive. So um, here is uh, some of the uh, scenario when we uh, start to put the poster boards on. And then um, this is your friend, right? Yes. Uh, I wanted to make mention of the fact that we wanted this process to be from an observational perspective. We did not want at any time to interfere with persons who were writing so that we would um, influence their yeah. thought processes or anything like that. So we sat from a distance and we, um, we observed, but I observed mostly because <laughs> DJ, as I mentioned earlier, was away. So we were very scared about the fact that people would not want to write anything on our board. And when DJ left, like for example, this first picture here, this was within two hours of putting the poster boards up. We were very, I was very amazed. I had to take a picture and send to her. I'm like, DJ, hey, you need to see this quickly. Yeah, I saw, oh, it was just right. in Chicago. I saw it, wow, nice. <laughs> and outside of it Let's being start. observational, um, I wanted to just, I asked permission from my friend who was uh, writing on the board if I could take her picture just for the process of pre presenting to our, um, to our class, which we did last semester. Um, Yes, we were very scared because we didn't think that people wanted to write anything or yeah. had any this idea. This is non-traditional research. Yes. <laughs> um, here's uh, the most well successful, we could say, and you can see like, like one there. section of it. So this one on the second floor yes. entrance was the most successful, um, where we get most of the response from here. So. Um, and then the colors are really, we can really see like how color become persuasive, like yes. red colors are more persuasive for people to just pause and then and the respond. Uh, the bright green works okay. Um, All but, the bright colors work perfectly well. But the, the a little bit dark pink didn't work very well. So we really like this color, but didn't work very well. Um, also our Ohio color, didn't work so well. Neither. So because it's so dark, uh, the, the color was too dark and then um, I think people would tend to write on more colorful yeah. post boards. Uh, the red one on the uh, fourth floor, um, we probably the least yeah. successful one. We still at least we got some comments yes. and then voices on that on the red one. Um, so most successful one goes to graphic. So if we're gonna do a project like this, um, if you are gonna do a project like this, I suggest go to that, that color, choose it, the bright color, so as bright as possible. So uh, then you know your audience will prefer that. Okay, so here goes to uh, semantic analysis. After uh, we all collected all the boards, um, uh, in total 28 of them, um, and I typed on typed all the comments on uh, on Excel board Excel. Um, so in total, we got 231 responses. That was uh, amazing. That amazed me because um, in in a project like this, we just put it on for a week or so, mm -hmm. uh, we get more than 200 response. Uh, we were really happy about it. And then I did. Uh, actually, this sports analysis, critical sports analysis, to guide semantic analysis because we engage critical educational theory. Um, that's why we use this sports analysis to guide semantic analysis. So, uh, also with uh, some frequency enumer enumeration uh, of the data we have. So, I came up. We came up with four themes. Okay, the first one's already there. It's a corrupted American food system and the environmental issues. So what people want to change, first of all, that's the environmental issue, especially food system here. So we, we can see that our students are, and community members are very mindful of, of the environment we're living in. So our second theme goes for uh, Ohio University culture. So we'll go through uh, the four themes in depth. So mainly about rape culture, tuition fees, professors, and their egos. <laughs> And also something, uh, something related, like a lot of uh, uh, social justice related issues, uh, especially gender and race stood out here. So, 
Um, our last one is to change self identity, body image, including girlfriend, spouse. <laughs> so these are dramatizing, very dramatizing yes. you know, comments um, or that made our day. So some of them. Okay. So we'll go through the crap, uh, the the four things uh, in depth, and then to to give you a sense of uh, how our analysis look like and how we connect with uh, uh, critical cultural theories. Um, so for the cor corrupted American food system and environmental issues, we tend to look at like larger structural issues. Um, and then inductively, we see how um, how our responses goes this way. The meat, the meat and dirty industry, dirty, dirty industry, not dirty industry, sorry. And then there are more. They form into dialogue eventually, some of the uh, responses. So one of them says, I want to change American food waste. And then there's arrow goes, I want to change American diet. And then um, here goes maybe another person, I don't know whether it's the same person or who, who um, says, you feel me? Right? So here's dialogue going on on our poster boards. So we're, uh, we're very glad to see dialogue come in based on voices, not just single voices. So social change should happen collectively, where people build collective agency. So uh, first of all, people should find their voices. Now we've seen collective agencies starting from that one here. And then I have some more about, I want to change the corrupted food system of America. So that is the center of our scene. There's more, um, I want to change uh, I want to change oil reliance, reliance. deforestation, deforestation, global warming. Great, thank you. <laughs> I'm not very good on reading uh, the darker color. So, um, so these are um, the themes about. These are the comments that relates to the theme about environmental issues and corrupted food system. So the other one, it's really hard to read. Right? Right? Yeah. So we'll never use this color again, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, so here goes to the second thing uh, about the Ohio University culture, especially rape culture, because um, our poster boards were put up right after the Core Street incident, right? So some of you might know if you were here last semester. Um, so there are stories going on about rape culture, and then people are resisting against this um, the rape culture in, uh, on campus, especially uh, drinking culture sometimes as well. Um, here, the first one that goes to our uh, goes to our data is the perception of sexual assault on campus. So um, I think the video of the sexual assault on Court Street is still on YouTube. So very that that was very sad. And then our we we can see our students are really engaged with social justice. Um, something like, uh, this is the voice of protest against the sexual assault on, on campus. Um, more related to the thing is, uh, because we, the time, you know, when we're doing research, we really consider, we're considerate of the space and identity, but also considerate of the time, space and time, because we put up during the final years, right? So what students are considered about is professor's ego. So, um, I feel like as a as a teacher, I should step back and think about my role as a teaching assistant and also, you know, a, a student. So students are really care about their professor's ego, especially about grading. Um, there are some more. We want to change education system. We want to know more, but this is one word, right? <laughs> OU is culture. So that's um, our thing statement. Um, here, uh, it's really my hard. To mine. Okay, my professor's mind. Yeah, change my grades, please. Okay, uh, there is some more about OP's OP's role, like international students who are learning language here. Um, at least the seven comments are about, about OP. Um, about the OP, like um, they're dissatisfied. They're not satisfied with the schools. Um, I don't. Even, I don't know much about the story because we only have some some voice for change here. So, uh, so for for questions or issues like this, um, it, it will be better studied our next phase interview. So face-to-face -face interview or you know focus groups. So that would be 
able to locate more problems, more issues that are happening in the university. Um, so what's on here? Uh, how education works? Yes, how people should think education works. So these are meaningful statements because these are something we are thinking about all the time um, as an educator and as a student. Um, the last one, then, tuition and fees, right? <laughs> tuition fees. Um, there are there are tuition fees. Um, more than ten uh, voices and statements of, about tuition fees. So this really relates to our uh, tuition rates or um, other issues related to students' personal lives. So, okay, here, yeah, cost of tuition. Here comes our third thing. So, there were. Quite a number of um, responses relating to social justice, mostly as Peter mentioned earlier, relating to gender and race. Um, so, simply put, someone wanted to change the injustice. Is it injustice on campus? Is it injustice in general? Is it injustice at the Ohio University campus? We're not so sure. Then, someone wanted to change the world. And as DJ <laughs> mentioned, there was a little bit of dialogue going on because you notice that someone right, wrote, sorry, um, true that, or true that. <laughs> and then also, someone wanted to change the gender stereotypes that existed. Again, are they gender stereotypes here on campus, or are they gender stereotypes um, in general? Or in their culture. Or in their right. culture. Mm -hmm. Then someone wanted to change discrimination. Um, as an international student, I've heard, you know, stories of discrimination happening against you know persons from other cultures. These are some of the things that we heard coming out, or we saw coming out. One person wanted to change gender inequality. Another person wanted to change the mediocrity of victimization complexes um, fostered and pr propagated by so feminism. feminism. So simply feminism want to start a war against the feminists. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then finally, someone wanted to change the illusion of gender and race. So while someone else or other persons identified, someone was saying, hey, what are you talking about? It's all an illusion. There's nothing wrong with what's happening in relation to gender and your race. Then we come to what I think is perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of yes. the research. Relating to self-identity, we kind of grouped a lot of things together, body image, girlfriend, spouses. Someone wanted to change their girlfriend. Um, we saw even persons writing, oh, I want to change my wife. Um, interesting. <laughs> someone wanted to change their gender. Um, again, we see that dialogue, someone else saying, me too. Um, someone wants to change I can't body, image. body image. Um, then we saw persons wanted to change their background, and also persons wanted to change their image. Now, what I think is, is pretty critical right here is that it may seem very simple, you know, these are, but you know, these are things that people are actually thinking about. And it kind of begs the question, you know, does the university provide services for persons who are you know, experiencing some of these issues? I know that there are some things that are provided, but do these students know that they can go to counseling services or, to X or counseling, yeah, counseling services, okay. thank you, to just you know, voice their concerns and have some sort of dialogue going on? Um, these are these are these are critical issues, and I mean, like DJ said, this happened during the like, well, close enough to exam time. So yeah. you could tell that all the pressures of student life was coming on, and persons were persons were venting, um, yeah. wanting to change your your image or your your body type. It, it's something that we've heard within the the news arena for some time now, and it is something that we should I think we should. You know, yeah. consider no, no. Our most dramatizing one was, I want to change my underwear. Yes. And there is a huge dialogue going on about the underwear thing, yes. about personal hygiene, <laughs> cleanliness. And that was, I, guess, I think it's more than 20 responses on yes. one, how I want to change my underwear. Yeah. <coughs> so that was very, uh, I would consider as cool and dramatizing as a researcher, yes. because that's actually a university student care about, right? So. <laughs> So that all also categorized as our self and identity. So um, especially during finals, hopefully um, you should think about you make some time to shower. <laughs> okay, here so, are our four themes, right? right. So um, 
what we what we noted or what we started out with was that the library opened up a space for participants to think about the things that they would want to change in their lives and as such we believe that social change starts when people find a voice within themselves and as Miles Horton says simply put life educates um, one of the things that you know, we, we found even in our education and social change class from Professor Jillian, who unfortunately is not here today, is that there is this, the, the formal education system is good, but Miles Martin emphasized the fact that educators need to incorporate some of the struggles and the dreams of the masses in order for persons to have their voices heard. And we believe that this project, in a sense, gave students a chance to air their concerns, to air their voices. Granted, it may not get to, uh, it may not get any further than here, but at least they were able to say what was on their minds. They wanted to tell us, you know, about the things that they want to change, and it relates very much to what Miles Horton speaks as it relates to organized education, as opposed to incorporating you know, all the struggles and the dreams that persons are experiencing. Yeah, it's highly connected to our everyday life because educational experience has to be meaningful. That must connect to our students or our educators' everyday life, right? So the, the seed of change can eventually grow. So there are other sections of our of reflections. So um, we believe that uh, these voices are turning into a dialogue, voices of differences. You can see that students are uh, um, from of differences from different background here. They mm -hmm. care about the different issues and how is that voice of different can eventually make a difference, right? right? So that's why we call for that one. So this group of different voices that eventually build a collective agency for the change. So our next reflection is change starts here. So here I'm gonna uh, present uh, a, a three. Uh, voices or dialogues based on um, what's on our data. So one uh, one comment says, "How how about changing ourselves if before starting changing all of their of all of their that might be a typo, but that's exactly what they wrote. So so think about changing ourselves first. Once we, when we want others to change, right. or we we want to change the larger social you know structural issues." And then another statement that's also, I, I believe that's very meaningful, be the change you wish to see in the world. So that's a very quite, you know, inspiring statement that's for what like Joseph says, yeah. I'll start with the man in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. So, and then also the reflection can uh, start to think about when we create change, no matter where educators or students or people with collective agencies, when we when we want to create social change, we must consider our environment, right? So uh, this comment says, you should change what you can and change to accommodate what you cannot. So this is a very wise sentence for both of us, um, suggested that we must rethink the space for change. So here's our, our, our uh, reflections and um, we'll present our implications. So from, from this project, um, we, in the process and after the process, we really feel, deeply feel that um, as educators and students um, or university community members, we call for educators' mindfulness and uh, uh, creativity to open up the space for alternative voices like this. Even if it's just the, the tra like dramatizing, you know, dramatizing voices, like I want to change my images or my underwear. So um, you must have have a year to listen to that, listen to our students' everyday lives, mm -hmm. so, and create this alternative spaces, like uh, library spaces in, on the second floor and the fourth floor. So, um, and we also hope to use our project as a technique to cultivate cosmopolitan citizenship, starting from create small changes, even plant a seed of change in our students. So what I mean by cosmopolitan citizenship is a global, uh, culture-aware citizenship. That's the goal of demo, uh, democratic education, uh, according to John Lewis. Um, our last uh, implication is um, to call for dialogue, to call for dialogue, to build such space, you know, to build solidarity and collective voices and agency 
and that's where change eventually will start and spread. So um, <coughs> that's basically what our research is about. If you would like to welcome you to have questions. Okay. Thank you. to you know give enough time for people to to write we wanted to give enough time for people to I guess see what other persons wrote and in a sense think about what they themselves would want to change or what they themselves would want to see happening um, we didn't have a specific timeline for our class because like I said this was for a class project mm -hmm. so we didn't have any specific timeline we just had to get it in before the deadline so yes I actually when we the day when we took out that was when the final paper came, so. Yeah. <laughs> that was, we asked for a little bit of extension. We presented the paper earlier, so if we can do it earlier, um, we probably will put it up maybe during the middle or even at the beginning of the semester. Um, might get more response or- we Make um, different response. Or different time. responses based on um, different time. We haven't really discussed that, but yeah. it is something to think about because um, when we presented this project in our class last semester, our professor was just as amazed as we were, and in fact, she was the one who encouraged us to, you know, bring this to the attention of a wider audience. So it may be something to consider. Yeah, we need a team. That's why I'm <laughs> because I'm from communication studies and she's from international studies, and then in order to get more, you know, researchers participate, I. We really hope we can have a research team, a collaboration across, you know, graduate student, student bodies, one or two, uh, even undergraduate students can actively participate in the research processes. So at least one or two from each department, then this is a huge collective work. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yes, Tom, and I think it was really interesting that you mentioned your, your the implications of this and the need to voice certain concerns that students could be facing right now. And now, I don't know if you have thought to bring the method to the different units that are um, uh, you know, uh, in charge of this kind of situations, international students' uh, office or uh, counseling and all these different areas, because it seems like a very um, open space for students to express. So, uh, if you have thought about it or um, yes I thought about it especially the ones uh, the comments the voices with dissatisfaction with OP uh, but I haven't find a way to uh, to get to you know who to speak to and then what questions like this in what way to address so probably need to seek help from faculties and then or international um, affairs office so they probably can elaborate on this as well. Yeah. I wanted to know, had you thought um, of trying another technique that would be similar, but I don't know, something different than posters? We, well, we wanted to, we thought about using, um, like, I don't know what you call this kind of word. whiteboard. Yes, sorry, thank you, <laughs> the whiteboard. And we also thought of, putting them up within the, um, the Baker Center. Center. But I think we kind of just threw that idea out the window because one, I think, because of the fact that we wouldn't be there to watch the boards on a regular basis because, as I should, I should mention, other students within our class tried similar projects. Yeah. And they tried the whiteboards, they tried, yes, and they didn't gather as much responses as our boards did. We're not sure if it is, the, the material that we used, we're not sure if it was the space that we used, but we think it was the space that we used. <laughs> yeah. But um, we, yes, we did, we did think about using other materials. Yeah, so. they, they, were, they put like whiteboards or different ways, like 
uh, sticky notes, and yeah. then uh, one of the group, one of the group, a graduate student did it in Dante, mm -hmm. and then one group did uh, something similar. Um, some, somebody did before I die in, in, in the Baker Center. Um, however, the whiteboard wasn't very successful. It's because some people find something they don't like, they read it. Right. So researchers aren't able to track the, you know, track the process of the, uh, the voices and response. Yeah. And I guess what I meant to say was, if you tried something in the future that was slightly different, I wonder if your results would be different. Like you mentioned, trying at a different time of mm -hmm. the semester. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, thinking about putting on the graffiti walls outside of. Uh, um, there's a lasher hall on the lasher hall. There's a parking section, but they have a graffiti wall like um, section over there. So that's what we're, I'm thinking. I'm going to put um, like chops, um, and then it's easier to track, change, take pictures every day. So that that's where. Um, Possibly our second project will take place. Yeah. But what percent did you quantify what percentage of the things written on the boards were people filling in the blank and what percentage were people responding to something that somebody wrote in the blank? Um sorry, can you um can you clarify your question? I well if somebody said I want to change mm. the US food system. Yeah. And then there must have been people who, near or around that, responded to it rather than filling in a blank themselves. Yeah, they responded. Yeah, right. I, put, I typed what, it. Uh, were, there more, were there more of those responses, or were there more people filling in the blank I in the total project? I think there were more persons filling in the blank. Yeah, yeah. even um, though they put on the side, they are still considering, I want to change. Right. Uh, like the Wi-Fi, change the Wi-Fi, probably complaining Wi-Fi is too slow. So yeah. I think there were more responses that are directly related to the statement as opposed to more yeah. responses that are related to persons responding to what persons you know, Yeah, we've um, seen dialogues, right? right? As an actual percentage, we don't have, but just by looking um, at, the, at the posters, I think that there were more responses related to that. Mm. Thank you. Yes. So did you see any sort of like common ways that people approach the board when you did the, the observations? Um, yes, I did. I, I sat on the second floor um, a number of times, and I would see people pass by the board and they would be like, it's like they caught their attention and they'd stop, come back, and they would look. And there was deep thought on their faces just by reading. Um, some laughed. Um, some, you know, like had a quizzical look on their faces, um, but for the most part, it was it was really some serious deep thought that I saw. Um, I would think, you know, persons were reflecting maybe on you know some of the things that were written. Maybe I don't know, it, uh, brought back something for them that they you know had experienced or you know they thought about themselves, and then it took like I would say probably. Uh, five, seven seconds, you know, for them to actually do a quick glance and then, you know, approach it by writing what they also wanted to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was, it was, it was interesting, you know, just to see how they responded to what was written on the board. Were there very many people that just wrote something silly? I would say very many. Um, I was actually surprised because I actually thought that that was a response that we would get. So I wouldn't say that there were you know, many. I thought that were more. There were more serious responses um, as opposed to, to funny responses. I'm surprised. I was very surprised too. <laughs> yes. Just as a comment, um, mm -hmm. as somebody who did participate in this, and I had no idea that you were behind it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I was walking by, and what caught my attention was I wanted to change my underwear. So you know, knowing me, I obviously stopped. <laughs> and you're right, though. Something silly caught my eye. Mm -hmm. But then when you start to write, you think. Hmm, if I'm really going to do this, might as well write something meaningful. Right. So it did sort of trigger that uh, reflective sort of side of you. Mm -hmm. And so even though I stopped because of something colorful, some you know you think somebody's just doodling on this. Right. You stop, you read it, you might laugh, but it makes you think, and then you write something else. Mm -hmm. 
don't remember what I wrote. Maybe I wrote one of the silly ones. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's why we in our data collection and analysis uh, throughout the process, we all we respect all kinds of voices. Uh, even some something we might consider as silly, yeah. um, or something we consider as. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just wondering if you guys were like welcoming different responses from the same person. Because I remember, I thought uh, uh, immediately I knew that it was like uh, probably a research. So um, during a period of like a week, I was going through different kind of psychological, I, I guess, um, states. So I wanted to write more. Like I did one day, and the other day I was like in the other floor, and I wanted to write more. So I thought, hmm, is that going to be, you know, with form the research? or? But I didn't see anything you know, that says if you write something, don't write again. Or, yeah, and um, that the was, of the research. That was, that was something that we, we we're very aware of, you know, that yeah. there were persons who would write more than once. Yeah, especially the environmental, uh, yeah. the corrupted food system. I believe some someone right, like repeated a uh, like second floor and fourth floor uh, section. We didn't we didn't like do um, an analysis of handwriting or anything like that. To uh, kind of, you know, but we were aware of the fact that there were persons who may have written more than once. Yeah, and then well, we also respect that because if you. you even though the voice about the food corrupted food system on the fourth floor and on the second floor, right. the dialogues are very different. So we really appreciated that. And also, if one person, um, if anyone here, you you would like to write multiple times on a different when you feel you know differently. Right. So that's um, it's like that's okay. this is my cool level change. I would say it's like our human body, our mindset is changing every day. Right. But your story is coherent. So we we also would like you to think about yourself and in different situations and um, you give different voices. So thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, first of all, um, I would encourage you to continue on. You did a great job. And um, but I'm wondering, as a follow-up, uh, with voice and place, again, I think it's two things that you see constantly now. We saw it with, especially social media, I think more, especially young people are finding their voice. And we saw that in a couple of places recently where it was tied to place, and I'm thinking of Tsukabi Park and Tahrir Square. And I'm wondering how, as a researcher, perhaps how change gets, takes place in the place of Tahrir Square, or does not take place in, in what happened with New York, if there are also cultural things that prevents change from happening. It's like this definitely a larger social structure issues, or constrain, constrain the change, or constrain the agency to make the change. So, um, so from your, uh, I'm not very familiar uh, with the, the case you were talking about. However, uh, I was thinking about if uh, we can think about social media, connect this, uh, and then put that on social media, we might we might not be able to focus on the educational setting. Yeah, that's what we're thinking. Um, on one of our classmates did one on Twitter um, and Facebook. Facebook. So um, the response are, not education, not very education also. I, I also tried, after we did this project and we presented in class and we got the response that we, we got, I tried it on Facebook and it didn't get me anywhere. Nowhere. <laughs> Nobody yeah. said anything about wanting to change anything. Yeah. And also I feel a physical space would be more powerful rhetor and rhetor rhetorical to uh, someone who's working here. So any place we we are in is rhetorical in some way. It asks you to do something, persuades you to do something. So um, this connects to uh, communication researcher Carl Blair's uh, research on national museums and the, uh, how the voice and space. So that's uh, initially um, why we choose this um, space to be the voice. Hope that answered your question. Yeah. Social change, you know, when people came 
the marker and write something by invitation. You are just leaving the space open. Uh, it's very interesting to take the invitation and to decide to make it out. So that area of antiquity is also uh, interesting to, to explore other places where that invitation is taken. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs>